Standing by the Terry and Ted podcast is sponsored by the UPS Store Canada. Hi, I'm Terry DeMonte. That's Ted Bird, and uh, hello, Ted. How do you do? I'm uh, I'm doing good, actually. I'm, I'm glad to hear I'm it. Above, <laughs> I'm, above, I'm above ground. Yeah, looking at so. the potatoes from the top down. <laughs> Anything so, else is a bonus, yeah, eh? So that's a good thing. Um, it's the uh, kickoff to season five of the Standing By podcast. It's been a while since I stat, uh, sat in the studio and um, tackled another season of the uh, Terry and Ted podcast. And we want to thank everybody who was encouraging us to do another season. We appreciate that very much. Um, if uh, you're watching on YouTube, I will uh, introduce our guest here in uh, just a moment. Um, But first, we have to say thank you very, very much to our title sponsor, the good people at UPS, David Drucker and all the associates across the country at the UPS stores. Canada uh, are uh, proud to be our uh, title sponsor for season five. When I uh, uh, texted David to say that we were going to do another season uh, and wondered if he wanted to continue his support, he said... He said... Of course, glad you're on the mend and know that I am pleased to be title sponsor as long as you run, even when it becomes Terry and Ted's Tales from the Rocking Chairs Between Oxygen Hits. (laughs) Not sure if we'll be able to sustain uh, a run that long, Ted, but... uh, But what a mensch David Drucker is, eh? Yeah, and uh, the UPS stores, I tell you this all the time, if you're a regular listener to the podcast... It's a great spot for almost anything you need to do business-wise, and it's a great spot to do anything that you need to do grandma-wise. Like if you have to send something to grandma in Edmonton, UPS can handle that. If you need to shred documents, UPS can handle that. If you need to make copies, making copies. Why would I need to shred documents? (laughs) (laughs) What have you heard? (laughs) Um, If you need to uh, get something to uh, an associate, you need to get papers across the country in a big hurry, uh, the UPS Store Canada can handle all of it for you. And what I love about them is their franchise stores, all run by people that live in your community that know exactly how difficult it is to run a small business because they're running a small business of their own. So if you have a product that you need to get across the country, if you run a business out of home, or you just got to get something to Auntie Griselda The UPS Store Canada is where you want to go. There are over 300 million jillion locations across the country. (laughs) (laughs) I may have exaggerated that because I don't have the actual number in front of me. There are hundreds and hundreds of locations across the country. UPS Store Canada, go to their website. Well, Ted, what would you like to talk about? (laughs) He almost died. Let's talk about that. All right, that'll be the uh, (laughs) focus of the podcast um, is, uh, is the fact that I almost died. And as I mentioned, if you're watching on YouTube, you see there is a beautiful woman sitting next to me. That beautiful woman is my wife and my hero, Jessica Ann Dion. Please don't ever say that again. Okay. <laughs> what, Jessica Ann Dion or yeah. my wife and my hero? Uh, my? no, the, the Ann part. Yeah. Oh, really? Eh? Are yeah. you one of those people who's not happy with your middle name? Uh, it's no, not it's, like it's Griselda. No, no, it isn't. No, I, I don't know anybody named Griselda, by the no. way. You use that name all the time, but it's not a well, thing. Well, it's because I'm a fan of the monkeys. Okay, great. Um, <laughs> Is but, that from the monkeys? Yeah, my Auntie Griselda. My Auntie Griselda. It took 15 seconds. It's like Davy Jones was right here in the room. Sorry, love, I interrupted you. No, it took 15 seconds for it to go off the rails okay. completely. It's all good. It's great. Well, the, the reason that my wife is here is because my wife was my, uh, she r- really helped save my life. Um, I was in hospital for 31 days, and for each of those 31 days, Jess was at my bedside for 12 to 15 hours a day. And um, I went in for, um, and I guess if you're in Montreal, you may have heard, because Bill Brownstein did a little article, if you follow me on social media, Jess posted something uh, when I was about to get out of the hospital, I think. Okay, so yeah. Heard. Um, and um, I was uh, diagnosed um, about a year ago or more with a uh, bum heart valve, uh, my aortic valve. He had a heart valve in his bum. bum. <laughs> <laughs> That's not right. <laughs> no, somebody didn't follow those plans very well. 
I and and um, it was first discovered by. I got to give a shout out to, <clears throat> excuse me, um, my friend Doctor Uman at Cardiogenics. I was a member at Cardiogenics, which is a private healthcare clinic in Montreal. For how many years, sweetheart? Oh, about, God, I don't know. Yeah, like, like at least... A decade, yeah. I think, yeah. And um, they're all about preventative medicine, and it was Dr. Uman who first said to me, you have a heart murmur, um, and I didn't ask what a heart murmur was, but it was something that... I believe it's when your heart murmurs. Yes, and uh, when the, the cardiologist or the doctor listens and hears that, it sets off alarms, and then I was uh, sent off to Dr. Smilovich, another Montreal cardiologist, who became a friend and uh, helped me uh, understand what the diagnosis was. And they said they were just going to keep their eye on it for a little while. And they did. And then we moved to Vancouver. And um, I got a cardiologist out there. And the cardiologist said, I don't like what I'm hearing. We're going to send you for an angiogram. Now, an angiogram is where they... Uh, they shoot dye into your body and they look at all your arteries and how your heart is working. And they discovered that my uh, diseased valve was progressing faster than they thought it would and said, uh, we're going to have to schedule you for surgery. And I went in for surgery on January 3rd of this year, which happens to be my 65th Mm -hmm. birthday. And, uh, Five hours after uh, I went into the operating room, Jessica got a call from the heart surgeon who said, everything went great. The the operation was a success. Yeah. And uh, you take it from there, love, because it all went into the shitter after that. Well, yeah, they... I got the call and you want to get the call five hours after and not two hours into the surgery, because if it's too early, you know, something's gone terribly wrong. Yeah, did they wrong. tell you how long it was going to yeah, take? Yeah, five hours. Okay. Yeah, between, f- they say between four and six, so I figured five was a good estimate. So that's what they did. And they called me and it's the surgeon that called me. Okay. And, and when it's, just to be clear, it's a valve replacement. That's yes. what they did. They yeah. replaced yes, the exactly. heart valve. Yes. Okay. So, so, yeah. so is it a, uh, is it like a... Um, the tissue valve. Okay, yeah. so so it's like a, a um, what's the word I'm looking for? Artificial. Yeah. Uh, well, it's. Um, yeah, there. Yeah, it's an artificial valve, but it's like a pig valve, basically. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, you can get two. You can get a mechanical valve. Yeah. Or you can get a, a what valve. they call a biological valve, which is a valve from a cow. A or, biological. Or, okay. Thing. All right. I'm sorry. I was no, yeah. that's okay. you. Go ahead. I'm just curious. Um. And yeah, so I got that call saying. Everything went fine. And one of the things that maybe a note for surgeons is when they're calling to tell someone that the surgery went well, maybe lead with that and not say (laughs) the call was, hi, this is Dr. So-and-so and and, uh, I'm just calling with regards to Terry and uh, we did this aortic valve replacement and I kept saying, and? I'm aware of this, yes. This is not news to me. Can you please tell me? And he said, yeah, everything went fine and he'll be extubated. So they do have to intubate you uh, when you're going through that surgery because they have to put you on a heart-lung machine. So tell, tell people what that means. There's, there's a so tube in So it's a in tube me. in right. the throat, okay. which uh, brings air to the lungs. And okay. basically it was a big thing. Uh, a lot of people were on ventilators and that's what that is. Um, yeah, so, that was a big thing during COVID. Exactly. I kept hearing that yeah. intubated. Yeah. But yeah. nobody really explained what it was, but it was, you know, it was basically just to keep him alive. So they uh, extubated him, uh, I think three hours after the, the surgery, and that was fine and that was all according to plan. And they said, you can come see him as of 9 a.m. the next morning. So I went to see him, and he was sitting up in a chair. And he had been, he had this big uh, bandage on his chest where the, the, the wound was. And uh, they was having some delicious Vancouver this, General Hospital food. Oh, boy. If you thought the food was bad in Vancouver, the hospital yeah. food is... Uh, yeah, okay. Um, but anyways, so it's... So he was lucid at this point. Yeah, he was okay. fine. And he, w- he looked sore and, and not happy but that's fine and um that was it and i thought okay here we go and they make you do the uh, the breathing exercises with the spirometer you know it's which that thing that you have to inhale and the little balls go up you know yeah. it's and uh they kept saying okay uh, terry it's time to do your exercises and he kept going <laughs> and blowing into it and i said you have to inhale they don't want to check anyways so <laughs> <laughs> Stop it. Stop it. <laughs> so that was good. And yeah. then he was fine for a couple of days. You know, they started to um, send him for a walk and obviously not 
not unaccompanied, but, yeah. um, <laughs> and it know. just, <laughs> but, but typically a surgery like that, you're in what they call the cardiac surgery ICU and people stay there for five days and then they're sent up to the ward where they recover for another, you know, it could be anywhere from two to five more days. And then you're sent home. A surgery like that is normally seven to 10 days and you're back home. Um, by the, uh, fourth day. Was it four days? Third. Yeah. Th uh, yeah. So four days or three days after the surgery, rather, um, he began to say some really weird things. Um, and he, he was sitting in a chair and was he, he medicated? He, he was medicated, but here's the, here's the interesting part is that he said to me and I texted you and said, uh, yeah. you know, he, he looked at me and he sat up in the chair <laughs> and he said, so, uh, what's the plan for tonight? We're, uh, we're going to Nova Scotia. <laughs> And, and he was dead serious. It was dead serious. <laughs> yeah. and I got I a said, giant <laughs> hole in my chest with like 99 staples and stitches. So when do we leave for Nova Scotia? <laughs> so I said, I, I don't, I don't think we're going to go tonight. We'll probably, <laughs> probably keep that for another day. And I thought, well, he's probably on a lot of meds that are yeah. making him a bit loopy. And he, he, uh, he looked at me at one point and he said, you know, my arm is tethered to my body. Mm -hmm. And I said, uh, yeah, as it should be. It's mm -hmm. good. And I thought, why are you saying these weird things? And I, I began to speak to the nurse and the nurse said, um, you know, does, is he like, how is he as a person? And I said, well, weird, but that's, <laughs> you know, that's where we're at. But not this weird. But yeah. And I said, but <laughs> not let's go to Nova Scotia. <laughs> <Yeah. weird. laughs> so she said, uh, the thing is when people start to say funny things, it's usually a sign of delirium. And I said, okay, I don't, I don't know what that is. So she explained that uh, delirium is uh, like a post-surgical thing that will happen, but it's also usually the first sign of infection. So they told me actually in elderly people, when uh, elder, elderly people have an issue where they, they start to babble or say something, a lot of people think, oh, dementia. But a lot of times it's the first, in, uh, the, like the first indication of a bladder infection. Mm. So that's what they check first. And she said, he's not on any meds that would cause this. So there's something else going on. And I never thought that it would be pneumonia. I didn't, I mean, it, there was that possibility that it would be pneumonia, but you, you just, you, you, you know, you don't go into these kinds of things thinking you're, he's going to have all kinds of complications. Um, and, uh, I spent the day with him and he was complaining about the food and I said, okay, well, I'll make you something and I'll bring it for you tomorrow. And so I went home and I made bread and like egg salad sandwich and all kinds of things to do that. And, um, I called the next day to say I was on my way and they said, unfortunately, uh, things took a bit of a turn last night and he had to be reintubated, meaning there wasn't enough oxygen getting to his lungs and they needed to put the tube back in. And, um, he was completely unconscious for the next seven days and um so seven you lost seven days well he actually lost 20 days yeah that you don't remember not a thing jeez lost most of uh january most of january didn't exist for me that's and, crazy and i you know it's it's funny the surgeon says to you you know prior to uh prior to your surgery date he says you know and of course there are possibilities of complications which I didn't dismiss. Yeah, I didn't think you know I'm some kind of Superman that wouldn't get any complications, but uh, I also didn't. You know, when somebody says to you, you, "You pneumonia," you think, "Well, you know, I've known people who had pneumonia before, and you know, I'm sure." Oh, well, I had it in the summer, and yeah, I, you know, it was something fine. that you battle through and whatever. Um, this this pneumonia was caused by. So by the intubation. So it's what they call like an ICU, you know. I pick, yeah, yeah infection. I picked in, up yeah. the infection from, from in, inside the intensive care unit. I picked up the infection. And did that trigger? It triggered a whole bunch of yeah. problems. So yeah. the thing is when there is a, and I'm, I'm not a doctor at all, okay? Yeah. But um, what happens is that when there's no air getting in, the lungs obviously don't inflate and then they start to collapse and then fluid starts to build and there's all kinds of things. And then, yeah, I need to try to keep it yeah, so no, that no, you no, don't pass ahead, out. Yeah, yeah. Um, so they, they do that. I'll just that. put my head down on the table when I get really faint. <laughs> okay. Um, so um, they, 
they started to take x-rays and they started to notice that his x-rays, his lungs were very cloudy. And when they're cloudy, it's because there's not enough air getting in. And so they forced the air through with the ventilator. And for the first 24 hours when he was re-intubated, he actually couldn't breathe on his own. It was, it was completely, when I was watching his chest go up and down, it was completely the machine that was doing it. There was absolutely nothing he could control. Um, and after a few days, they put him on intense um, antibiotics. But the thing with pneumonia is you can either get viral pneumonia or bacterial pneumonia. And thank goodness he had bacterial, so they can treat it with antibiotics. If it's viral, it just has to pass. Right. And that's a lot scarier. So that was good. But um, when you are going through this major surgery, they put in what they call a pick line and like a central line where they can uh, put meds into your main artery and it gets into your bloodstream faster. Uh -huh. Oops. But you can't keep it in in the same position for an extended period of time. So they had to move it to the other side, and it's a big thing. And, and this the, goes in, you're pointing to your neck. Yeah, yeah. to my yeah. neck, yeah. yeah. So in the artery, watching. one of yeah. the big arteries in the neck, um, whatever artery that yeah. is. And uh, so they had to move it from the left side to the right side. And when they did that, um, something got in through the bloodstream and it <coughs> caused a blood infection. Now, a blood infection so is... So this is on top of the on pneumonia. On top of the yeah. pneumonia. So this Christ. is, yeah, we're just building on top. So now he had a blood infection and a blood infection can cause sepsis because every the blood brings everything to the organs and then your organs can start shutting down. Thankfully, he was already on antibiotics and they were able to control that, but it was of concern. So um, they just, they kept going with those kinds of things and it was mainly the breathing and the pneumonia that were the issue. Yeah, breathing is apparently quite important. It, it is, is important. Yeah. Yes, my uh, yeah. I, I do a lot yes. of it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Save friends. <laughs> Everyone loves <laughs> breathing. Yeah. John, a little shout out to John Moore there. And so you're completely oblivious during all of yeah. this. I, I don't recall any of it, and I only found out, um, you know, post, uh, really post hospital stay, um, how dire it was. I I was. I was, uh, as my brothers uh, pointed out, or you know, he used the phrase, I was knocking on heaven's door for about 11 days. Uh, no, for those, it was probably about four days four where days. it was very 50-50, where we really didn't Jesus. know. Yeah, where they said, my brother said to, um, I should say my brother Dean um, has his his whole life, He's he's been a helicopter paramedic, he's been involved in medicine. So he was an observer. He flew out to Vancouver to become an observer, and he flew out to Vancouver to become an observer when things got quite dire. Okay, so it was he flew out when it went south. Yeah, yeah. He, he hadn't yeah. planned on coming out. No, no. But no. When it went south, he came. Yes. Yeah, and there's family. Yeah, absolutely. And um, at one point, he turned to Jess and said, "Do you guys have your affairs in order?" Jeez. So it was really, um, it was, uh, it was touch and go. For what, four days, love? Well, four days for that. And what happened is that when you give someone that many antibiotics, they have to start working at some point and the infection should clear, but the infection wasn't clearing and the air still wasn't getting through to the lungs. So what they did is they sent him for a full body CT scan so that they can get sort of a 3D picture of what's going on on the inside. And one of the doctors... It was a fantastic team of doctors, and they were solving it like a puzzle. They had a whole bunch of people there, and they were just looking at him like a... Yeah, well, like why don't a, we tr what, should we try this, or maybe we should do this? Yeah, and it was... And were they keeping you in the loop they the were the, do the doctors were unbelievable, and with Dean, it was easier for me to understand uh, what was going on, because I was he knows asking... his way around Yeah, that and I was asking yeah. questions, and I'm not... I'm a medically rational person, so I can... I can ask the question. I just didn't know what I was asking. And once I knew what to ask for, then it, then I started to not freak out as much. Um, but they sent him back after the seat, the full body CT scan, they actually sent him back for a chest CT scan. And when they sent that, those, they got those results back. They realized that he actually had a pulmonary embolism. 
which is a blood clot. So <laughs> let's do the scorecard here. <laughs> yeah. Pneumonia, yeah. Yeah. Blood, blood infection, infection. pulmonary yeah. embolism. Yeah. Yeah. Are then, we done yet or uh, is there so more to also, come? He also had pleural effusions, which <laughs> is water accumulation in, uh, mm -hmm. near the lungs and around the heart. And, um, and did the pneumonia trigger all this or did it all happen independently? Uh, it was kind of... Uh, some of it was independent. Um, uh, yeah. I, well, at I one think point, Jess sent me a text saying, uh, leave it to, you know, they said there could be some complications. Yeah, leave it to them. Terry to get all of, all them. of them. Yeah. <laughs> Collect the bunch. <laughs> <laughs> Collect the whole set. Yeah, you know, I, I don't I don't mean to make light of it, yeah. um, although I am making light of it. Well, but it's, it's easy to because you're good now. So, yeah, yeah, and and it's, uh, it's a hell of a thing to realize that you came that close to uh, checking out. Yeah. And... Uh, you know, I, I don't mean, I don't want us to, uh, you know, the reason we decided to talk about my surgery is because it became public knowledge. Bill Brownstein wrote a, a really nice column um, shortly after I came out of the hospital, I think. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people descended on me to ask me how I was doing and what, you know, how I was recovering and what happened. And we didn't really talk about the fact that I was in big, big trouble and, and, uh, to the point where friends, you know, not you know, a couple of very close friends said, you know, if Terry dies, you know, we'll we'll you know we'll be right there. Like it, it became a distinct possibility for you know my wife and my family to have to think about what they were going to do. And of course, I I say this, you know, I've said this to Jess a thousand times. She really was my advocate and my hero. She was there every day pushing and questioning and, and, you know, my family was, um, you know, sending me videos and, and people were visiting and, you know, I remember people coming in and talking to me or playing me a message from my parents. I have vague memories of that as I lay on death's door in the ICU and it's a, it's true what they say, those kinds of things put air, you know, under your wings sure. and, and help you fight. And at one point, my brother said, what did my brother say? Dean said to you, it's up to him yeah, now. Yeah, he said, you know, a, a medicine can only go so far. The patient also wants to, he has to want to fight and want and, and want to get out of it. Yeah. Because there are people who give up, you know, people yeah. who just think this is too hard, I can't do this, or they don't feel like they have anything to live for, or there's there's all kinds. And but, I spoke But if you're not aware, if he was not but aware of what But subconsciously, there is a, a there's thing. There's a will. Apparently, yeah. okay. apparently, apparently I, I don't know what that is. Which but is, it's, really, it's really quite astonishing because I, I have vague recollections of when I began to get better and come out of it, you know, I didn't realize she was, she was basically standing... I don't want to say death watch, but yeah, it was it, like vigil. Almost. Yeah, it was, it was vigil, yeah. waiting to find out what was going to happen, and I, I was unconscious for most of it, and didn't realize what had transpired. Even after I began to come out of it, eh, love, I, yeah, but there you were, didn't say, "Hey, you nearly died." No, <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, it's not the right approach. No, apparently um, not. But it's you know, it, it, when they discovered that he had the pulmonary embolism, the blood clot, which was the size of his thumb. And it was blocking, uh, I don't remember which side, I, th I think it was the left side, and basically no air could get in. So there was an obstruction there. And when they figured out what that was, they put him on this very, very intense blood thinner, and it was a therapeutic dose of it. So it was, you know, like, I don't know what it was, but it was really, really intense. And they began treating that. And as they began treating that, these drugs don't, uh, they don't break apart the clots, but they allow the body not to create new ones, and then your body uh, responds, sort of responds and, and, yeah, and right. sort of breaks them down so sort by of itself. Pre preventive. To yeah. The so extent. they had to do yeah. that, and once that started to work, it started to turn. But they can't keep a tube in for too long because the throat, uh, you could really damage the throat, the vocal cords, all kinds of things like that. So um, doctors approached me and said, we would like to perform a tracheostomy. And when I heard that, I was like, I had images of people, you know, where they have emergency situations and then they like cut them and put up straw in their throat. I was like, what the hell is you this? You have the, the voice box oh, thing. No. And yeah, so and I, I've... so they said to me, and, and I had to sign off on this because he couldn't, he couldn't make asleep. any decisions. Yeah. And, you know, Dean helped me a lot and we weighed out the options. And one of my biggest concerns was 
what if it damages his voice? Because if he doesn't have that, yeah. is does he does he want me to make this decision that could really affect? And it's a big decision, but I figured that, and it was probably a bit of a selfish decision too. But I figured we can learn to to deal with that. But if you die, well, it's, yeah, survival comes first. I right? think so. Yeah. yeah. So I just you know, but I did look at all those things and. I finally gave the go-ahead, but before they performed that surgery, they decided to extubate him and see if he could breathe on his own. And they extubated him, and you just didn't do very well. No. Um, he, he, and are you still out of it at this point? Yeah. Okay. It's very, yeah. very... And do you want me to mention the, uh, the whole uh, hoopla? Did he shit his pants? Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> that happens. We'll get, no, we'll get we'll get to that part. Oh okay. yeah, good. Um, so when you're under, you know, when you have this many drugs in your system, yeah. uh, you know, and th they're sedating him and they're taking him off the sedation, they extubated him and he had no idea what was going on. I didn't know where it was. And they said, "We'd like to just do a couple of things. Would you mind leaving?" And I said, "No problem." And I went out and took a. Uh, you know, big long walk and I get a call halfway through. And when the hospital calls, you want to die because it's like, what is it now? Yeah. So I picked up and they said, you need to come back because we, we cannot calm him down. Um, we just don't know what to do. And we just think that you'll, he'll respond better to you. So ran back to the hospital, went in and he was tied. And I thought, okay. Like restrained? Restrained, yeah. yeah. Feet Goddamn. and hands. Yeah. So I said, what... What's going on? And the nurse came to me and she said, we've had a major issue. And I said, okay. And she said, he just punched us. <laughs> and she said, we have no way of knowing if that was a real threat. And I said, I assure you, that's not who he is. And he'll be mortified when he finds this out. And I'll apologize on his behalf, but you have to understand that he's not in his right mind. And she then went into the system and unfortunately forever now he is yeah. coded as a violent person. Oh, yeah. No way. It, it was it was a it was a very young nurse who said, you know, after filling me full of drugs for seven days of all kinds of, you know. Well, it was more than that. It was like eleven or twelve days at that point. We don't know if he meant to do that. Well I, you know, I, I don't remember any of it. I was going to say, and you were blacked out the yeah, whole time. Yeah, I was eh? blacked out the whole time. And I guess I panicked or, you know, they were trying to restrain. Uh, who knows what happened? But I wasn't there, and, so I yeah. had no idea. Anyway, the, the, the end of that story is I did, um, uh, at the end of, of uh, well, not, not the end of the stay, but I got out of the hospital. We were home for about a month. And I said, I want to write a letter and buy a gift for the nursing staff. They were so unbelievable. They were so incredible. And I got to apologize to those nurses in person. And oh, say, good. And how did they, how did they take that? Did well, they accept the, your apology? The, the, uh, the, the dramatic right. nurse who was the dramatic one who labeled me as a violent patient, right. she wasn't available. Oh. Um, and, and the older nurse who said to me, listen, I've been doing this a very long time. And it happens a lot. Don't even concern yourself. It wasn't a big deal. But it was it was one of those many things that happens when you find yourself in uh, in dire straits like that. It was just... Uh, I, well, yeah, I, especially I, if you're all hepped up on the goofballs well, it was, and you yeah, don't know what you're doing. Yeah, it wasn't me. It just, it wasn't, obviously it wasn't me. And once, once the... Um, is is that the end of the near-death stuff, love? Or? Well, just there's just the... the oh, yeah, the there's the... Uh, no, the, there was none of that. <laughs> no, no, no. There no, was, there none, was of none of that. No. Um, but so they did this procedure where they put this little tube in the throat, but yeah. they can take out the big tube. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's he's got he looks like a Pez dispenser. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, look at that. Okay. Yeah. The little uh, a little scar there. Yeah, yeah. 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 little. Uh, can't, you can't see it even on YouTube, but there's there's a little scar there where the the Pez dispenser the Pez went in, <laughs> and and, uh, and and I couldn't I couldn't talk for. Three days? And, uh, about a week. About, oh, let's see. I don't know anything. So, so let's down. Let's that was awesome. it. Yeah. yeah. And well, well, even the first time you came on the uh, the radio show, yeah. uh, our Saturday morning show on Light 1067, your voice was thin. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. I found that you got back to a full voice quite quickly. 
surprisingly quickly yeah. under the circumstances. Yeah, I think so. And and it was uh, it was I I didn't really know what that was. I didn't know what a tracheostomy was. I thought they were dropping little uh, little ball bearings. It felt like they were dropping little ball bearings in my throat. Mm-hmm. It and wasn't that at it all. It wasn't but... that. And and I thought that they. Uh, I accused them of operating me while I uh, operating on me while I fell asleep on a couch. I was I told her I was on a couch in a waiting room and they just took advantage of me <laughs> and put this little ball bearing in. And he my- also told me that um so basically it looks like a bit like a dog collar and there's a bit of a there's like a little plastic thing on the yeah. end of it. And he said, you know, celebrities are getting these yeah. and they're getting them with diamonds yeah. and gold. And Becoming I don't, a new fashion thing. Yeah, it's a whole fashion trend. And I don't want any of I that. I don't want any of that. Yeah, I, yeah, I don't want any yeah. diamonds on my I want to be on that bandwagon. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. it, yeah, it, it was, as you can see, it's the reason we're talking about it is because I want to encourage people to, uh, well, first of all, I want to clear up whatever, you know, uh, there was the, uh, well, Fatso got what he deserved. He had a heart attack. That's not true. That's not what happened. And that, and yeah, uh, that's what he gets for living that lifestyle. All of those years he was on the radio. That's not true. What happened was I was the recipient of preventative medicine. I went to the doctor more than I thought I should. And that's what I want to encourage people, especially people who think they're fine. You know, there's a lot of people, and you and I have known a bunch of them, um, who say, well, I ride the bike and I do the thing and I, you know, I run 10 kilometers every morning. I'm absolutely fine. I don't need to see a doctor. There's all kinds of things that go on behind the scenes of your tits that you really don't know a thing about and you have no idea what's happening. For Christ's sake, just go to the doctor once a year and let them put a stethoscope on your chest, that's the way they discovered I had a heart valve issue. Yeah. Um, you know, the doctor said, you have a heart murmur. Murmur, murmur, murmur. <laughs> and I thought to myself, I, and I, you know what? I was, I was dumb. It, uh, this was probably 2017. And I didn't say, what's a heart murmur? Because the doctor said, it's just something we're going to keep an eye on. Mm-hmm. And I, I can't stress enough, especially for guys of a certain age, and it doesn't matter how old you are. You could be in your 30s and get stricken by something. But as you know, as you get older, just go once a year and and have somebody, you know, tap your knees, look in your ears and put a stethoscope on your chest so that you can avoid it. I also, know. especially if there's a family history, which I know yes. there is not in your no. case, like you and this probably helped you pull through. You come from pretty strong stock. Like everyone in your family yeah. used to be 130 years old. Yeah, I do. I I'm lucky that way and I, you know, I I it, I can't even begin to describe and I don't want to start because I I'm going to cry, but you become a wash in gratitude when you yeah. come that close to to leaving. And, uh, and, and coming out the other side of it. And even though there are some fun stories, aren't there, sweetheart? Oh, the other There's are some ones. fun stories about shit in the bed and, uh, um, what's, what do they call the, uh, the cow wrangler thing that they use uh, to lift me? It's just, it's just a lift. Yeah. They, know. they, cow wrangler. <laughs> yeah. You know what it is? I made the mistake of saying one night I was very, I wasn't a good patient at times. Shocker. I, I was very uh, squiggly and I could never get comfortable and I had all kinds of wires in me and, you know, I kept trying to get out of bed and the, the nurses kept saying, just ask us, just ask us if you want to get out of bed or you want to move, we'll help you. So I got in trouble from Jess and my brother. My brother said to me, if you don't start behaving, we're going to call dad. <laughs> <laughs> And you're 65. Yeah. And how old is your dad? 87? 87. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, because I was yanking on the lines. Well, he and- pulled out his art line, which is the main line, and it's connected to the main artery. And he was on really intense blood thinners. So if you pull that out, you'll bleed out. And were you aware of what you were doing? No, at this point? I wasn't. So you were still out of it. Right. Okay. But I do remember at one point, Jess, and I had one eye open. And she she moved my head towards her, and she said, "You're the problem now. You are the problem now. If you want to get out of this fucking hospital, then you're going to have to start behaving." 
And I remember, even though I was out of it, it, it began to sink in. So those messages were getting through to me. So one day I said to the nurses, I'd like to move. <laughs> and they said, okay. And then they moved this pulley and bag over the bed and then pushed a button and it went. <laughs> Did it have the Bugs Bunny music? They bump, 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 <laughs> yeah, it should have. <laughs> and they pushed me in the bag and then they lifted me like a, a, a young calf. Yeah. So as the mesh is wrapping around my body, I'm like this going, <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> and they lifted me above the bed as the mesh swung back and forth and adjusted my pillow and then put me back down. And it, it, was, uh, it, it wasn't dignified mm -hmm. and it wasn't a lot of fun. And it was one of the many stories that we, uh, we have from, uh, uh, I, 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 don't, I don't necessarily think we need to discuss the, uh, no, I don't think the so. The evacuation uh, of the bowels yeah. in the bed? I think we're good with that. that. But I, I did want to share one, which was one okay. of my favorites. Um, okay. I, I walked in one day, and they had removed the tube, and the breathing tube rests between the nose and the mouth, mm -hmm. so like that little piece of skin there. Yeah. And um, it... When they like take the it off, like the piece you see with someone with an yeah, oxygen exactly, tank, yeah, exactly, like yeah. So it yeah. just it's just kind of there, and obviously he had been in bed for so long that his his beard was growing, and the nurses took it upon themselves to shave with like a dollar store Bic razor, so you know he had a bit of cuts. Made on his this face. noise. <laughs> <laughs> so I, they had done the tracheostomy. He didn't have that anymore, but because the piece had been there for so long. There had been a little bit of a scab, and I walked into the uh, the ICU, and I looked at him, and I said, oh, you, you, you shaved him? And they said, yeah, yeah, looks good, right? And I said, what's going on here? Because it's, um, it's a bit Germany 1939, is it not? <laughs> and the nurse- You had the Hitler stash? I did. The toothbrush <laughs> mustache? The nurse looked at me, and she went, oh, my goodness. And then she went and got a razor, and she took it off. <laughs> but I thought, yeah, yeah, well, there you go. Is you know, these were, you know, we tell the stories that that are, uh, uh, you know, they're they're. I don't know if they're great stories. I don't know if they're funny stories, but they're stories from a very long thirty-one day hospital stay. And I, you know, I don't do that to scare people. I don't, and I'm not doing it to, you know, keep you away from your doctor. You know, as a matter of fact, the opposite is true. I'm hoping I can encourage you to go to your doctor. And I should add that as many cardiologists have said to me, a heart valve replacement or a bypass surgery, any open heart surgery is now routine in big hospitals across the country. Vancouver General Hospital is one of the most well-respected cardiac units in North America. Some of the best doctors in the world were there and I got some of the best care in the world. And I, I, like I said, I, I have a, sh a, a soft spot in my heart for Dr. Uman at Cardiogenics and Dr. Smilovich, who's a cardiologist here in Montreal. These people are so dedicated and know what they're doing so well that most people who go in don't collect the whole set of complications right. like I did. You can be home. Some people are home in a couple of weeks. I saw I saw a lot of people and people who were in their you know late eighties and they were out in yeah. three days. And it and it's the way they describe it in hospitals is this is for them a Tuesday. It's a routine surgery. I think on the day that I was operated on, my cardiac surgeon I think did four of them. No, 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 he no, no, he can't because they're six hour surgeries. It's oh, not right. enough time. Okay. Um, well, that's but no, it's two surgeries, two surgeries a day. I wouldn't a day. want to be the fourth one. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, let's see. Where was I now? <laughs> so it, it's, you know, it, it's, uh, I, I don't do it to, you know, we haven't decided to do the first podcast about where I was and what happened to me um, to frighten anybody, to, you know, disparage anybody. Um, I just, I want people to know what happened. I, I had a medical condition that needed to be addressed. And it was addressed, and I came perilously close to dying from complications. It was quite dire and quite scary, and um, it's it's a bit of a long recovery. I'm still, 
you know, I still get a little tired in the afternoon. I'm a little, um, I'm a little, uh, a little slow mm-hmm. in in the afternoon. And for the first month, I had the Joe Biden shuffle. Right. You know, that's the way because when you're in bed for 31 days, um, your your leg muscles. You know, my legs were like Twizzlers. Yeah. It was like a couple of <laughs> trying to walk on a couple of pieces of licorice. <laughs> it was like you know, blah, 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 blah. so that that. That's, that's, I didn't, I got to experience that, that atrophy, that muscle atrophy. It's like you have, I can remember uh, being in the hospital after a snowmobile accident when I was a teenager for, it was maybe two weeks maximum. Mm -hmm. And I more or less had to learn to walk again. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really, it's quite astonishing. And, uh, you know, and the other thing is, is I, I didn't eat anything but ice chips for like 28 days. Um, and as an extra added bonus, I wasn't allowed to swallow the ice chips. So I was being fed through a tube in my what, nose. Are you, are you like literally? Yeah, you no, didn't seriously. Eat yeah, no, yeah, seriously. No, seriously? Yeah. That's no not, drink? No hyperbole there? No. Nothing but no. ice chips? Nothing but ice chips Jesus. that I wasn't allowed to swallow. Nothing to drink. Nothing to eat. It's not because it was like a, you know, a, an awful situation. It's just that because he had the, the trach and the tube, they need to make sure that his throat muscles hadn't you right. know, given up and then you could choke and then there's a whole new complication. Right. The upside was I lost 31 pounds. I was going to say, so yeah, the that, first, the first I, picture that Jessica posted yeah. of you post surgery and post complications, you look like a million bucks. <laughs> I, I thought <laughs> I'm going to have that operation. I'd like to look that good. I was going to say, I don't recommend the diet. No. I really, really don't. Um, and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's just a pleasure to be up, what did you say, on the other side, the right side of the potatoes? My, my friend Steve, uh, my farmer friend down in New Brunswick, Steve Henry, two-time New Brunswick Hog Producer of the Year, by oh, the way. By the way. Mm-hmm. Plug okay. for Steve. Yep. Yeah, he says, uh, as long as you're still looking at the potatoes from the top down, everything <laughs> else is a bonus. There you go. And and it's uh, it does, I have to say, it changes your perspective and it gives you... Uh, it gives you a lot of gratitude, and and um, and it, it's really nice to be here. It's nice to be anywhere. Yeah, actually, as they say. Well, it's good to have you. It's Thank good. you. I was going to say have you back, but you never went anywhere. Yeah, yeah. and you you haven't fainted yet. Of course, I haven't. I show, know. Haven't, no, haven't, don't show me. Show don't me, show me the scar. The scar. <laughs> no, I don't want to see it. I don't want to see it because I'll be uh, I'll be I'll be down like a ton of bricks. Jess, how? What was the period of time? The t- the duration of time that it was fifty fifty. And how did you deal with that emotionally? Were you all over the map? You you said earlier that you were that, that the more you knew, the more the better yeah. you were able to handle it. Eh? Yeah, I th- it was about it was like four days where it was really fifty fifty, um, but it get it kept getting progressively worse from the beginning until we got to that fifty fifty stage, and then it started to look up. But in those when he was reintubated. Uh, I didn't know, I'd never seen someone except, you know, on TV, I'd never seen someone with a, a breathing tube and you become painfully aware that without that machine, he's dead. So you, you look at it and it, you try not to panic because you know that it's doing something good, but it's hard because you have to look at it and be medically rational, rational, but I had to also um, you know, it was him. If it's somebody else, if I'm looking at somebody else in the other bed, I don't know them yeah. and it's unfortunate, but it's not my situation. And this was, it was, it was very hard and I found it, um, you know, I, I, I didn't eat for, I don't know how long, uh, which, you know, everybody kept saying, you know, the best thing you can do for him is to take care of yourself. Yeah. That's super helpful. Yeah. Super helpful. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, you say that one more time, I'm going to wake him up and get him to punch you. <laughs> so I, you know, I, I would go home and I found it very, very hard to be at home alone. You know, I had the cats and that's, that's good. But, um, a lot of people said, you know, I'll, I'll come out and I'll come stay with you. And I didn't want that. I needed it. I needed to be alone to gather my thoughts and to, to deal with it. And the, the thing that I kept saying is to myself was, when I go there and I'm next to him and even if he's unconscious, I need to be like, we're, you know, things are stable. We're, we're, you're doing okay. You need to keep going and, and things like that. Because if I went to the bedside and cried, yeah. I really felt that he would feel that. And then you go, well, I must be dying. So, 
should I just let go kind of thing? And I don't know. I don't know how this works. I don't know. And we'll, well never know that, but it works. Yeah, it worked. And I, and I, like I said, I have recollection of, of, you know, people, um, you know, Jess, Jess was my, uh, she was my advocate. She was my hero. She was my guardian angel. She was, uh, she was also, you know, she was the guard at the door. There, you know, there was only people that, that were very, very close got in to, you know, encourage me and, you know, tell me to fight. And, and they, they didn't know if they, they didn't know if they were doing any good or you could hear me or that, or I could hear them. Um, but it, like I said, I, it's true what they say when, when you're fighting like that, um, that makes a difference when you hear people saying, you know, come on, you, we need, you know, you, you gotta, you, you can beat this. You gotta, you've got to push on, even though you're completely out of it. There's something, I guess, in the subconscious that is able to, you know, I guess, help you heal. That's the only way I can describe it, I suppose. But really, I kept saying that we were, to, you know, it was just at my family, my mom and dad's uh, the last couple of days and explaining to the, the family that it was Jess who took the worst of it. Because I I was unconscious. I yeah. did I didn't know what was happening. I found it yeah. I, fa- I found it particularly hard to manage um, what to say to people. Because at one point I was starting to run out of things to say that were positive. Well, there was no good news. There was no good news. Yeah. And I remember a couple of times, you know, you and I exchanged back and forth, and I. At some points, I just didn't know what to say because I didn't want to say, well, you know what? It, he might die because it doesn't help. Yeah, you and never said that to me. No. Never. You, said, you did say he was critical. I did, yeah. 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 But critical, they kept using the phrase critical but stable, yep. and that brought me a lot of comfort because stable is what you want to be. Yep. And so that was that was okay. And I have to say one of the doctors at VGH, um, his name is Dr. Umadale, and he is like the head of anesthesiology in BC. Like he's just a a genius. And he spent a lot of time with me. He had to do rounds on a Sunday and he was going to every patient. And somebody walked in asking a question, a nurse or somebody. And I heard him say from across the room, you know what? I'm just, I'd like to go spend a little bit of time with Jess. I just want to explain a couple of things. And he sat with me for, I don't know, 20 minutes, which 20 minutes in doctor's terms is a very long time. And he explained everything, and he never said, you know, this isn't looking good. He said, there are things of concern, and here are the pathways that we can, that we're exploring. And if that doesn't work, we'll try something else. And there was never a time where a doctor said to me, oh, well, good luck. You know, there was, there was none of that. And also, because you have an advocate at your bedside, for example, you know, Ted, I suffer from psoriasis. Yep. And I had to stop my psoriasis drug. So some of my psoriasis came back on my legs. And Jess came into the, the, uh, t- to the ICU one day, and I had red splotches of psoriasis on the bottom of my legs with black magic marker around. The, somebody had, you know, the staff had circled the, the patches with black magic marker, and she said, what, what's that for? They said, well... We're keeping a close eye on this because we, you know, we think it could be sepsis. I said, it's not sepsis, it's psoriasis. And they said, oh, okay. Okay. Well then that's good then. And you need somebody, you need somebody there to say to the staff, he's, he's not, he doesn't have a fever. He's always hot. You know, like he's, he's not, he's squirmy because he's itchy all the time because he, you know, like there was all kinds of things, things. that she knows yes, that they that didn't the staff know. staff couldn't yeah. know. So every time I walked in and there was a new person, I would say, okay, here are a few things. He's chronically itchy, always hot, always mm-hmm. sweating, has psoriasis. Anything else I'm missing, just, you know, let me know. And they, they once they understood that, you know, and I kept replacing, had a bowl of ice and ice water with a face cloth. And every four minutes, I would take the face cloth off his head put it in the thing and then put it back on and it would cool him down. And we yeah. managed to bring his temperature down because you, you, of that. You know how I love a hot room. Oh boy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when the sweat and the steam comes right up <laughs> yeah. through the top of your when, head. When uh, Ted and I were working together, I, you know, and, and uh, when I, when I was doing television, the crew wore parkas because I would insist that the room be so cold. Yeah. Uh, so that gives you an idea. Yeah. Well, you don't want to be all covered in uh, in uh, Schwitz while you're yeah. on the TV. I don't know how to segue from Terry almost <laughs> died to a commercial. 
<laughs> I have no idea. Hmm. Maybe Save we- friends. <laughs> <laughs> you uh, know, the, sorry, Poseidon? I was going to ask a question, but it's kind of dumb. Well, yeah, you know that, what? Let, there let me, are no dumb questions. Listen, let, no? Me, let me talk about Merson, okay. and then we'll go to Poseidon's okay. question. Hold that dumb question, okay. Poseidon. Okay. <laughs> Merson are kind of like doctors. They're car doctors. Yes, They're they doctors are. for your car. Yes. Dr. Charlie, Dr. Celso. Uh, the Mersons uh, have been uh, doing cars, fixing your car, putting tires on your car, maintaining your car uh, at St. Jock and Cavendish for uh, what, Terry? Since the early 70s, Ooh, I believe. Yeah, I think the 1870s. Yeah, Ben yep. Merson started it. Well, first of all, Og Merson invented the tire <laughs> in the uh, Code St. Luke tar pits back around 1 million BC. And then Ben opened Merson Automotive, I think around 1970. And uh, they've had some turnover in staff. You yes, know? yeah. Mike is new. Uh-huh. Alvaro, I think oh. that's his name. Okay. He's new, but yeah. the old guard is still there. Charlie's still there. Chris is still there. So also still there. Bill's not there. Bill, oh. Bill didn't come for the busy season this year. Oh. Bill was like the Michael Corleone of okay. Merson. They kept dragging him back in. But I think they've left him alone and okay. allowed him to retire full time now. All right. Uh, if you need tires for your car, if you need maintenance for your car, uh, if you need repairs for your car, go to Merson Automotive before you go anywhere else because they will treat you right. They will not do any work that doesn't need to be done and they will not sell you any product that doesn't need to be sold to you. And what more can you ask for than that? Honest is the day is yeah. long is the slogan. I'm telling you, these people are just, you know, not only do you get bang for your buck, but when they say to you, you don't need to replace your fizzle sits until the spring, then you can be you rest assured and confident that your spizzle stits will be fine. I needed a new spizzle stits this spring, but I thought I was going to need new summer tires and I yep. thought I was going to need brakes. And Charlie went, no, you're good. Yeah, there you go. Yep. You're yep. good till next season. Yeah. You know, and rather than go for the quick crash, uh, cash grab. Yep. They, uh, they were honest with me. And you can front. take your car there if you have a quick crash too. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Family run business where the owner is at the counter. And as I like to say, phone there. And they'll answer the phone. Yep. You Valerie won't... will answer. There you go. She's you... new as well. Okay. And lovely. All right. Merson Automotive, corner of St. Jacques and Cavendish in Montreal. MersonAuto.com. Poseidon? Poseidon? The dumb question awaits. <laughs> uh, I was going to ask, uh, did you guys ever consider that this may have been an assassination attempt? <laughs> It's just one thing after the next. Damn. I never thought of it that way. And I, I appreciate, I, I, when we were coming here today to the studio, I bumped into Poseidon on the street and he was like, I uh, I just, uh, I don't want to, it's just that I, you know, I didn't really want to, like he wanted to ask me and, and, and then and then and then you thought it was your fault, right? Because we argued or something. Oh no no! He thought just, it was his fault <laughs> that you got sick. Yeah, no, I just I didn't know what had happened exactly. He wondered if I. It's just that because uh, um, you know last season sometimes there's complications. Yeah with, yeah, uh, yeah yeah and I equipment and stuff. Yeah and I, and, I you know I get I get a little annoyed and and uh, bang my fist. And, yeah. <laughs> And then I didn't know I didn't know what it had I didn't know any details I didn't know I, I found out like last minute, and that I was just like I felt like a dick I was like shit the man no. poor man was fucking sick and I was <laughs> I was acting like a dick I just, what did I you just say you that. didn't want, you you didn't want to be responsible for the erasure of the radio legend is that what you oh, not responsible but I was like God damn imagine that's the last thing people know of me like before he went like. <laughs> That assassination attempt thing yes. reminded yeah, yeah. me. It reminded me of a movie called Young Doctors in Love. Do you remember that movie? I remember the title. I don't know if directed I directed by it. Gary Marshall. Okay, Penny oh, Marshall's loves husband. Him. Who's yeah. yeah, great, great, funny, uh, comedic funny genius. Yeah. yeah, Young Doctors in Love. Part of the plot was there was a gangster in the hospital, and a guy from a rival mob family uh, was trying to assassinate him in the hospital. Oh, and the hitman was played by Michael Richards, Kramer oh, no kidding. from Seinfeld, wow. about 10 years pre-Seinfeld. Wow. And a very, very funny movie. Oh, there you go. There's yeah. a movie recommendation in this episode. Young Doctors in Love. It's 41 years old this year, yeah. but it's fun. It's like airplane naked gun funny, that I, kind of funny. I don't think anybody was trying to assassinate me. I don't me, think so. Love, I just, no. I think I was... Uh, Collect the whole set. <laughs> Complications are available now. Have you got sepsis? Why not? 
that um, that uh, I think that concludes the medical portion of the uh, yeah of the podcast. Don't you done? think? Yeah, I've, I've, you don't want to tell the AFR story, story, eh? The uh, what's that? AFR. What's that? that's. Uh, <laughs> That's accidental fecal release. <laughs> if you hear that at the swimming pool, get out of the water post case. <laughs> There's something about hospitals where they're, I, I, doctors will be able to um, answer this question. They're quite preoccupied with your bowels. They're always asking you. It's because it's, it's, they're not preoccupied with it. They just need to make sure everything is running properly before they ship you off to some other location. And here's a good story for you. A, a guy, not a doctor, not a nurse, a guy. <laughs> like a... This, it was a nurse. No, 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 no. Well, they don't just let random people... No, 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 but they're, they're nurses' aides yeah, yeah, or that, something. That's they're, fine. They're, but they're they, not they're medically s- trained. But it's not some guy that no. walked in down off the street. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't a guy with a bedpan. It, well, it was a guy with a bedpan. And he came in to my bedside and he pulled the curtain and handed me the bedpan and stood there. And he was going to watch the operation? Yeah, he's, he said, you know, lift up your bum. And he put the bedpan under me and I thought he was going to leave. But he stood at the foot of the bed and went, okay, let's have it. And I eventually I had to say to him, was he was he recording it with his phone? <laughs> <laughs> he might have been. Eventually I had to say to him, this this isn't going to happen. Yeah. Uh, I I'm not accustomed to having strangers come on in the bathroom with me and wait for the arrival of the uh, the FR. Yeah. And there was another time where they j- they just kept saying to me, you know, you can't leave until you have a bowel movement. And I, I don't know if you've ever been faced with that problem to solve, but you can't just suddenly go, <laughs> come on. Chest. Hey. So watch your chest. Oh, yeah. yeah. I got to be careful. <laughs> yeah, I don't pop true, my right? chest yeah. open. Yeah. Yeah. So that, 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 that was something that I took from the, from the hospital that, uh, uh, is uh, well, I guess that's an indicator. Like Jess says, yeah. they need to know that everything's working well, and yeah. maybe that's at the top of the list. I, I think don't so. Know. It, yeah. it seemed to be a, a thing. And at one point, um, I called. There was a little phone outside of the ICU, and you'd call to be let in. And they said, uh, uh, "The nurse will come talk to you." And I, I hated that because I thought, "What's what is it now?" And she came out, and she had these, uh, uh, you know, latex gloves on, and she just hold them. And she said, yeah, we had a bit of a situation. <laughs> and I said, okay, I'll come back later. I knew what the situation was. And I thought, all right, that's, uh, that's good. My Thank brother you. told me that I, in, in my delirium, yes. I, I turned to him and said, I'm going to shit my pants. I think I'm going to shit my <laughs> pants. <laughs> he wasn't wearing any pants. <laughs> Oh well, these yeah. things happen. Yeah, yeah. And if it's going to happen, you you were probably in the best place for yes. it to yeah, happen. I, yeah, I was. And I, just to close this off, um, this this topic is, I, I I can't say enough nice things. If this happens to end up on somebody's radar in British Columbia, I cannot say enough nice things about the Vancouver General Hospital, the staff there. The, the cardiac team, the people in the ICU. I know you hear this a lot from people who've been into hospitals, but you really understand it when you are the patient um, that is under the care of these unbelievable angels, these well-trained, dedicated, special, special people who spent time with Jess and made her feel welcome every day. And I know the... Um, you and I paid, we were talking in, in season four about radio and I mentioned the Jeff O'Neill show at Fox and said it was one of the, one of the shows that in, you know, that's left in the country that I think is a, a well done radio show. There are very, very few of them left. Um, this one is staffed by professional people who really know what they're doing and put on a very entertaining show and do well. I think I love the yeah. Jeff O'Neill yeah. show. Um, and apparently he mentioned that on the radio. I didn't hear it that morning, but he mentioned standing by the podcast on the radio and, oh, thanked, nice. and thanked us. And I thought that was 
in an indication of a real pro. Yeah. And so Classy. if somebody happens to hear this, please tell the people at the Vancouver General Hospital, uh, we will be forever, forever grateful for the care that we got there. Yeah. And, um, and, and thanks for letting me go home towards the end of your stay. You know, you, you almost have to do the, hello, my baby. Hello, my darling. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> likes the Michigan rag. So that I could get, you know, you have to convince a bunch of people yeah. you're ready to go home. Yeah. And, um, I, I guess I managed to do that because yeah. by February 3rd, I was home. My experience at the Royal Victoria Hospital when I went through yep. cancer treatments yep. about seven years ago was similar. The people on the front lines of the healthcare system are dedicated professionals, and your welfare uh, and health is first and foremost uh, on their agenda. I know that the healthcare system can be a giant bureaucracy, uh, but on the front lines, yep. um, that was my experience as well. And they I, were tr just terrific. I think there's there's something special about nurses. There's nurses have a, a chip that I that a lot of people don't have the compassion, the caring. They're eh? a yeah, a lot of are. the nurses in the ICU you couldn't rattle them. Eh? No, from the stories you told me, sweetheart, you just you couldn't rattle those those nurses. Not at all. No. Nothing. Nothing. And. Especially me, the squirmy, annoying, itchy, impatient, sweaty, patient. impatient, not really violent uh, guy. Um, they they were never deterred. Never. And when we went, we we bought a small token of appreciation. We bought we bought the nurses unit a new coffee machine because they have a re they had a really bad coffee machine. So we went out and we bought a new coffee machine and got them a, a nice supply of of ground coffee because that's the way they get through their shifts. And we, I wrote a long thank you note and brought it into the, uh, the CSICU. Uh, yeah, to the CSICU and uh, met a couple of the people that were responsible for my care, and uh, I've forgotten what the point of that story was. Well, they're just they're just a special breed of people. Yeah, they're just it's a just special that. breed of people. It's. Uh, Thank you for being on the podcast, sweetheart. You're most welcome. Thank you for having nice. me. She's good. Yes. Yeah. yeah she's well, very, she's natural. She, she's been in been in and around radio for many years now. That's how we met. Yeah, I know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You have a story? You I want have to, not good. You want to tell no, a story? You no, know, you know what I want to tell you about? I want to tell you about Jaguar Land Rover Laval mm -hmm. because they are back. I'm thrilled about this. Yeah. I, I, you said you were talking to uh, Adrian. Adrian, and, and she relayed the message to the boys, and yep. they're and the back. Boys said, of course, yeah. yeah. Like David Drucker from uh, the UPS Store Canada, like Kara and Celso from Merson Automotive, no hesitation to come back and support the Standing By podcast, yes. and we appreciate that. Jaguar Land Rover Laval, I've said it before and I'll say it again, there are all manner of luxury vehicles available out there. What makes the difference is the buying experience and the service experience, and that's where Jaguar Land Rover Laval excels. I sent Adrian a note the other day and said, give me some talking points for the new season, and she said, read this, and she sent me... Uh, uh, an online review that they got, an online five-star review. This is from a customer. This is from Mitchell Adler. Okay. Mitchell says, from the moment I walked into Land Rover Laval, I felt comfortable just like walking into my own home. Some of the staff's, e um, it seems the staff's egos are left at the door before walking into work. No preference or uncomfortable, holy smokes, I need new glasses. No pretense or uncomfortable, snobbish attitudes at Land Rover Laval. The warm greeting, gratitude, and appreciation from the sales team was genuine. The professional approach from Shant, their customer service rep, I assume, was excellent. He understands how to speak to clients and deal with couples when buying a vehicle. Wow. There you go. There's your commercial right there. Yeah, and you could, yeah. I'm, I'm sure you could find a ton of those reviews uh, or just hear that anecdotally from customers at Jaguar Land Rover Laval. I've never heard anyone say they had yeah. a bad experience up there. They're good people. Yeah. You and know? it's it's a cool place. Well, it is. It's yeah. a cool place filled with really cool vehicles. Yeah. And McLaren's right next door. Yeah. And you can go look at those and you can sit in them and take a picture if yeah. you want. Yeah. Take it from me. I do it every time I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's such a nice shopping environment and i always say if you're a car buff even if you're not you're not buying they'll they'll, they'll yeah yeah they'll, they'll show you they'll around. welcome yeah. you and treat you well yeah jaguarlaval.com landroverlaval.com we thank them for coming back on board as sponsors yeah. and a big thank you to our title sponsor ups and as ted mentioned uh, the folks at merson and uh, 
uh, Jaguar and Lavender, blah, 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 blah. Them too. I, I always have trouble with that. Yeah. Um, uh, but Poseidon, thank you. Uh, pleasure. Nice to, uh, nice to be back and extend a, a nice warm welcome to us. <laughs> back. Is he back on those drugs again? Is this what he was like? <laughs> Believe it or not, worse. Yeah. Yeah. What time do we go to Nova Scotia, sweetheart? Uh, by the way, uh, uh, you guys want to do the tweet sheet? Oh, my oh, I forgot God. about the tweet yeah. sheet. We, we can were, go out on the tweet okay, sheet. Okay, we were just—I yeah. was just about to say goodbye. We thank you. Yeah, for I was no very problem. excited oh, when, I, when, yeah. I, when I put this one together. Okay. When I put this one together, I just stole some tweets off okay. Twitter. All right, but these ones are good. Okay, here Season we go. Season opening tweet hold on, sheet. Hold yeah. on, before you Hang read on. them, I got to present them okay. for everyone as well. Yeah. Hold from, on. From at Shen the Bird, <laughs> boss, what are you oh. doing? <laughs> Inventor of the bagpipes. I have no fucking idea. <laughs> Isn't that great? <laughs> well, I got a bag. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, Jesus, that's funny. Yeah, these are the ones that I can't use on the radio, yeah. so I'm glad okay. that we have the podcast for using them. All right, next up we've got from at David Eight Hughes. Son, daddy, is the moon just the sun with the lights off? Me, deep sigh. When I drop you off at school, do you just go sit in the fucking field? <laughs> <laughs> That's not very encouraging. No. <laughs> and we got one more here. Hold okay. Because this thing is being, uh, no worries, beside. Oh, from at Granite Dwine. A sex position called the Englishman, where you never make eye contact with your partner, then mumble, <laughs> jolly good show, and shake hands when you climax. <laughs> jolly good. Oh, God. Isn't wow. that funny? That's, uh, that's one of the great joys of the podcast, eh, Ted, is you can... You can bring the uh, the fuckings and the yeah. I can yeah. bring the uh, I can bring the off color tweets on yeah. that I can't use on uh, on uh, the radio show. Yeah, we should mention that on Saturdays um, I wander into Ted's studio and we do a uh, Terry and Ted on a Saturday morning at Light One Hundred Six Seven Nine to Noon. Nine to noon every yep. Saturday. Saturday morning with Terry and Ted. It's Light 106.7, 106.7 FM. FM online at Light One Hundred Six Seven dot CA. On the iHeartRadio app and on your smart speaker. So with all those options, there's no excuse for you not to listen. You better fucking listen. Don't make me come over there. <laughs> That's in the radio commercial. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, Poseidon, thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Nice to see you again. Nice Sweetheart, to see you too. I love you. Thank you. I love you too. Okay. I love you too. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Standing by the Terry and Ted podcast has been brought to you by the UPS Store Canada, delivering more for small businesses in Canada.